is uh, Vladimir de Turkheim. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. Uh, I, I've seen him talk a few times before. This is the uncomfortable talk in the GraphQL space because he's going to poke holes in all of our uh, all of our security blind spots. But uh, Vladimir, you can go ahead and come on and join the stage here. This is going to be a fantastic talk, a really critical one as well, especially when you're talking about distributing APIs to even sometimes directly to front end teams. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of opportunity or attack surface that gets exposed sometimes without being really careful in thinking through uh, the traditional just because you can, should you <laughs> kind of talk. Uh, so Vladimir, if you are ready, feel free to come go ahead and join the stage here. Let's see. Here. So he has asked to share. The internet deities are trying to connect the pieces together here. So we'll see what the uh, when the tech gets connected here. One moment. Definitely buckle in because this is going to be a, a big one. <laughs> All hey right. there. Hey, Vladimir. So did I say your last name correctly or did I butcher it? You, you, you said it. I think you as an English speaker, we said it the best way, the most correct way i've seen in my life so uh kudos for that you it was uh, pretty correct it's actually vladimir de turkem uh which is a yeah. real german french uh, name uh, i hold so um yeah, uh, I'm going to give a, a security talk today. Sorry, I've got these two webcam things, yeah. so I don't really know where to look right now. It looks like the other screen is where where we see you, just if you wanted to know. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you as much time as possible, so I'm going to hop off the stage. Uh, Vladimir, thanks for coming, and I'll see you at the end of the talk. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Uh... And now you should all see my screen and I should be able to start my talk. So thank you a lot for joining this talk about uh, GraphQL and the uh, application security perspective today. Um, and that would be a white to gray to black hatty talk. So uh, I will ask you to have a, a very open minded. Uh, it will be at the same time technical and not technical, but that's what you have to do when you give a, a security talk. So. Couple words about me. Uh, I'm Vladimir de Turkem. Uh, I, I work for this awesome startup named Screen. Uh, what we do is application security. Uh, basically, we provide you with solutions to secure your web applications uh, without hassle and make everything safer in your environment. Uh, but I will talk a bit more about that at the end of the talk. I promise it's not a commercial talk. I'm also um, a Node.js core team member. Uh, I've been having that for two years. Uh, it's a very interesting spot in open source to be able to contribute to such a big project because so many projects, including Strapi, uh, rely on Node.js and we have the ability to see a lot of different setups. And that's how I discovered GraphQL a few years ago through the Node.js world. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Paul Defet. Uh, the French speaker will get the pun. And uh, for the other one, I'm terribly sorry about this. Uh, impossible to write handle. I was young and innocent when I chose it. So that's it for the intro part. Now the disclaimers. I'm not a GraphQL expert. I am um, I do web application security. Some people do network security. Some people do operating system security. I do application security. And I protect applications. But also often I attack applications because you have to know how to break them in order to protect them. And I'm also a developer. My background is in development and I build tools to protect applications. And from this perspective, discovering GraphQL is, well, GraphQL is just another way to exchange data between a client and a server, usually over HTTP, but that's not necessary. And it's an abstraction. As any abstraction, it's designed to make your life way easier. And GraphQL is marvelous at that. It works really well at making everyone's life easier. But abstractions, they've got this thing that make you forget about implementation details. And 
actually implementation details as a security person is where I find my fun. Because abstractions and implementation details is where people make mistakes and mistakes turn to bug and bugs turn to security issues. But I'm definitely going too fast and I should probably do a regular talk rather than a, a, a talk about what, may, what I find fun or not. So that's a question I was asked uh, a couple of years ago um, when we, we started to think about protecting GraphQL applications at screen is, how would one attack a GraphQL application? Well, the first thing to do to attack a GraphQL application is to identify that the application is indeed using GraphQL. And that's actually pretty easy. Uh, well, I don't know if you know this extension. It's named Wopalizer. Um, it's a Chrome extension that tells you which are the technologies used by a website. And here I can see that I've got in the JavaScript libraries Apollo that is being used. And Apollo is a great company building a lot of tooling around GraphQL. And I'm pretty sure most of people using GraphQL in the world at least use one of their tools. And well, if there is the GraphQL libraries in this Ruby on Rails application, that is just a random application I found on the web. I don't even remember which one it was. Uh, that's probably it's because it used GraphQL. Okay, there are other ways to do it. For instance, so the first one I showed, use of GraphQL related libraries. Also, you can check the network behavior of the application and you will see that it posts on GraphQL endpoints or do get on GraphQL endpoints. And otherwise you can analyze the traffic and check that there are GraphQL looking payloads in the, uh, in the network of the application, in the networking of the application. What comes next? Now you have identified that the application is using GraphQL. Well, you want to identify the schema as an attacker. So GraphQL is a great tool. Everything relies on a schema, which is this contract between the client and the server. So you know exactly what will be available. And GraphQL has introspection features and a simple query can be used to identify the schema and that's where this talk will take a definitive weird turn because i'm going to a live demo and as this is a live demo the probability of something uh, going bad will happen so let's see how it goes here i've got a simple graphql application i can basically fetch items by their IDs, their blog posts. Don't worry, we will see this application in details a bit later. And I just have one single query that I copy paste from something you can't see yet here. And here, voila, I type this query and I got a huge response. Well, I have not written this query myself. I have actually just, you know, Googled GraphQL introspection query and copy pasted it. And this query actually tells me, hey, um, this API, it has a type name post that has a field name ID, which is an ID, a field name um, content, a title, which is a string and content, which is a string. Uh, you've got the definition of the scalars, but so I only use standard scalars for this one. And you also have a query object as in any GraphQL application with a method named post that actually takes an ID and returns a post. And this feature actually is here to provide the auto completion we all love in the GraphQL editor. So it creates good discoverability and great user experience for a GraphQL API because you know what is available and what you can ask from the GraphQL API. But thanks to introspection, I am immediately able to dump the schema and know exactly what's inside the application. So that was for the first of the two live demos. And one can say introspection might be disabled. That's actually true. But there are other ways to identify the schemas in that case. For instance, you could identify front-end libraries that are here to manipulate the schema. So here there is a library named GraphQL tag that is vastly popular. It's downloaded 2 million times a week. And it's usually used by front-end applications to handle pieces of the GraphQL schema. And uh, it turns out into usable objects. 
Well, I just need to identify this library, even if it's minified, even if it's uglified, I can identify it because I'm a lead hacker and to check what are the strings used with that library to identify part of the um, part of the schema, the scripts that are used by the application. And worst case, I just need to, you know, use the application and check what happens in the network tab. Well, part of your schema is public. And that's a fact. And you need to live with that. Your schema, or at least part of it, is public and can be uh, discovered. You can still make the, the hacker's life, life harder by hiding it, but that's the last part of my talk. Um, and the legitimate question that comes now is what to do with the schema now? And that's a legitimate question because, hey, my schema is public. Well, what about it? And now if you look at the webcam and at the screen at the same time, you will see that it will impersonate a meme, inject all the strings. Okay, that was ridiculous. Please don't post me on Reddit. Um, you can actually do string injections. And most of the vulnerabilities on the web historically are string injections. And string injections can lead to SQL injections, shell injections, evil injections, XSS. And all of that is possible by finding the right spot where and the right strings that goes well. Um, usually I heard a lot of people saying that uh, ORM killed uh, SQL injections. That's actually not true. And I recommend you Google SQL injection hall of shame, uh, where you will see a list of all the public uh, SQL injections that happened in the recent past. I will not quote any, any companies in this talk because I don't want to be sued, but there are some very big names of the internet and you can see that SQL injection is still well a, a today's problem. So the method to protect against these attacks is the same in GraphQL than in any other protocol. It's not because you have a typed interface at network level that you should forget about all the defensive and sanitization measures you have in your code. So for instance, if you want to prevent SQL injection, well, you have to use prepare statements. If you want to prevent uh, XSS, you have to sanitize to HTML escapes inputs. And that's the second part when I'm terrified in this talk is the second live demo of the talk when I will perform a SQL injection uh, live here. So remember this small app that tells us, hey, we've got the the, uh, the post you can get by ID and uh, find them. So for instance, if I do ID equals two, I get another post and everyone can see that I've got a weird thing with unicorns. So there is one in the background. And if I do ID equals three, well, there is no data there because I was too lazy to populate the database with more than three entries. And what we will do now is that we will run a few queries at the same time. So we'll have Q1, that is basically post ID one. We'll have Q2, that will be post ID two. We'll have Q3. And this one is to demonstrate to you that I don't have anything else on the database. And then we will have Q attack that will actually contain an attack. So usually you take time to find SQL injections. In this case, since I wrote the app, I know where the vulnerability is. So I will just add union select star from users. And we will run all of that. And what do we have? We've got the result for Q1 with hello world and the content. We've got Q2 with the stupid blog post about unicorns. We've got Q3 that is null. And the interesting one is the last one. So we've got an object that has the ID one, which tells us, yeah, it's probably not the same table in database than the one we got in Q1. And we've got a title, which is admin in between parameters. This is actually your username. That's because of how union injection works. And I decided, you know, to inject findable stuff in the database. And admin123, which is an unhashed password, because as usual, I am a terrible developer. Um, and there is nothing in GraphQL that prevented 
me from using a string injection and a SQL injection. Actually, it was even easier because in the schema, the ID field is on the ID scala, which usually accepts integers or string. So a lot of application are designed with ID being a number here and it's string injectable and GraphQL will not prevent you from having a string there. And that's actually one of the best way to attack GraphQL applications, scalars. So uh, that's it for the live demo part. And let's go to the talk talk part. The next thing we will do after that uh, is inject object. And the necessary response you would have is, wait, what? Well, GraphQL has the Scala uh, thing. And the custom Scala can open the door to object injections. For instance, the JSON Scala is very popular, and it can be a vector for object injections and can be used to do that. And object injections, they can lead, for instance, to NoSQL injections or to serialization or unserialization, uh, deserialization injection issues. And if you want to learn more about NoSQL injection, really feel free to go on screen blogs uh, where I wrote a few articles on that or to just put my name on um, on YouTube or Vimeo. I hope that's how you name this service in, in English, uh, because I gave a lot of talk about this topic and it's actually a fascinating one. But TLDR, well, it's not because you use GraphQL that you have type safety. A word about the users and users management in a GraphQL application. Well, it's very easy to do mistakes. It's It's very tempting to think that your GraphQL resolvers are just pure functions in the sense that they don't need to be context aware. They would still have database access. They would not be pure in the sense of functional programming, but they would be pure in the sense of, I've got inputs, I've got outputs, and the inputs from the GraphQL query is all I need to worry about. And thinking that way can lead to exposing the whole user database or exposing the whole database to a user. Anything linked to user must be checked in details and properly. In the REST world, in the legacy HTTP world, let's call the world before GraphQL legacy. Don't throw anything at me through the internet, please, for this. Um, you usually do authentication and authorization per endpoint on a REST application. You say, hey, so that's an admin endpoint and nobody can access that if they don't have admin rights. And of course, in GraphQL, you could have two different HTTP GraphQL endpoints, but come on, seriously. Um, so that means that your code must be user and context aware. You must know why you are doing that and for whom you are doing what you are doing. And there are actually two dimensions regarding this uh, awareness of context. You've got the endpoint right. And now uh, that's a poor written slide, I should say the resolver right. Um, you need to treat your GraphQL resolvers as you would with REST endpoints. So is this user allowed to access this resolver? Do they have sufficient rights? But that's not enough. Uh, we are in a GDPR world where data privacy is actually the big thing. And you also need to check data related well, uh, rights. After you have fetched the things, maybe because you, you probably need data from your database to do the mapping between user authorization and the content of the database. Is this user allowed to access this resource to perform this operation on this piece of data? And I know it's tempting to write small resolvers that go straight to the point that it's not the world we live in. Okay, on this sad note, let's go on the on my favorite part of the talk, which is best practice and gotchas. Uh, disable introspection if you can or if you want. Uh, as mentioned, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, there are ways to go around uh, a disabled introspection, but at the same time, well, if you can make these people life a bit harder, don't pray. Security through uh, obscurity doesn't work, but it's OPSEC. It's like when you uh, 
leave a light on in your house when you go on vacations to make sure that nobody identifies that you're away from your place and won't rub you. It's OPSEC. Just make sure that you remove data. But uh, I was discussing with a, a customer recently who, uh, who want to open their API for external use. And in that case, well, they want to keep introspection. That's totally okay because that's a public API. If introspection is not disabled, your API is public. Limit query depth to prevent denial of service. So I really love to put advice that have nothing to do with things I discussed earlier in the talk. So if you have a very complex GraphQL query, actually the CPU time to cover it might get huge. And the number of connections in your connection pool to your database you use might get huge. And the number of external API you call, such as Shopify, might get huge. And you want to reduce the amount of resource per query. Why? Because first of all, well, it can lead you to denial of service by abusing too many resources. If, if you open one billion socket on a, on a machine, it won't be happy. And also, if you're using a single threaded asynchronous environment, such as Node.js, AsyncIO, um, well, you've got a single thread. So if you spend your time um, passing the GraphQL query, well, you can't do anything else and you are in a denial, a temporary denial of service situation. So do that uh, with a complexity level. There are tools to do that. Also, or alternatively, enforce timeouts. So um, there's a hack in Node.js, ping me directly to know it, to interrupt uh, um, synchronous code uh, on a timeout, but uh, you need to ask me for it or to read uh, what I write because uh, this is not an OGS talk, but enforce timeouts, seriously. That's a way to prevent abuse of your API through very complex queries. Uh, GraphQL is really cool because you know where the data is or at least how it is accessed. So. Just sit with the security person of your of your company with the schema and check what is sensitive. You've got a unique chance, a great documentation for your API to know where the sensitive stuff is and where it's not. And also log everything in the resolvers. Not only it's uh, your legal duties in a post GDPR world, but it will make your life easier. So the more the more critic. And the more sensitive the data in a resolver, the more you need to log it from tomorrow morning, uh, not today, because you're looking at API days. Highly untrust custom scalars. Those are the entry points to weird stuff. So check what custom scalars you, do you have, audit this code in particular, and monitor what's happening there. That's an entry point that isn't standard. Okay, that, I promised I would talk a bit about screen a bit uh, longer. Um, we are about to release the GraphQL support in Node.js next Wednesday, uh, mostly because I'm off until then. But you can still use it. Just ping me or check the screen documentation. There is actually a configuration key to enable it for Node.js, which means that you will get protection for injections, uh, all the injections I talked to about. You will be protected against and a lot of cool other things that are linked to screen product. Um, we have a 14-day free trial. Feel free to use that to test the solution and see if it fits it, if it fit your needs. Or we even have a free plan that you might want to use uh, if you qualify. And for those using Ruby uh, for GraphQL, I will work on that after the holiday season. So expect something at the latest in February. And if you are using other technologies with GraphQL and plan to use screen, please contact us so we can planify that. Usually I would say that you have been an amazing crowd, but through the internet it's harder, but I will still say that you have been an amazing crowd. Thanks so much for coming to my talk. Let's keep in touch. You've got my uh, work email address, but my preferred way of communicating is Twitter at Paul Defates. Uh, I will share my slide on Twitter a bit later today. So if you want to reuse them, uh, just follow me and you will find that soon. And that's pretty much it for my GraphQL talk. Let me find a way to unshare my screen. That's it. Hey, Jesse. Hey, such a great talk. And also, I think everybody's kind of sitting there just going, oh, right. Yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> like writing down some scribbleless notes. Okay, gotta send this to. Uh... <laughs> Thanks a lot for the kind word. I try not to be scary in my talks, but on this GraphQL one, I was really going as, well, I'm a hacker. Let's just show them how it would happen. Uh, mostly coming from someone who told me that uh, it does. Uh, there is no SQL injections over GraphQL, and I wanted to prove them wrong because I'm this kind of person. Uh, <laughs> I think basically the statement there is no S uh, SQL injections is basically the guarantee that there's a SQL injection opportunity. <laughs> yeah, fa famous last words. So I see a comment in the in the chat. I'm not sure I want to go into more GraphQL stuff. Well, go for it. I mean, it's just an alternative to REST and the risks are the same. And as mentioned, you have a great opportunity to know where the sensitive stuff is and uh, to use that. Actually, GraphQL is uh, leading us toward a, a more secure future because we have a better knowledge of the resource. I'm totally sorry, Jesse, if I uh, bypassed the uh, reading of the chat. <laughs> oh, it's all good, it's all good. I saw the top part of the message, but I actually missed the question part at the end, so I'm glad you got that. Um, no, yeah, I think, I think that's also fair because GraphQL starts to create also um, almost an enforced abstraction layer to act for data access. And when you have an enforced abstraction layer, that becomes an opportunity to layer on security services, to layer on other pieces that uh, otherwise might be, I don't know, maybe somebody's trying to access direct or, or um, this way you actually really get to say, no, we wanna, we wanna access and, and observe every interaction happening with the application, so. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's very true. Also, in, in security, it's always a, a matter of uh, risk benefits. And using GraphQL a lot, the benefits of GraphQL are very, very, very high. So it's just changing our security mindset to adapt to this new protocol that we need to do. We're going to try and squeeze in this one last question here uh, before I bring on the next speaker. So since there is a multi-part, uh, there's multi-phases to the evaluation of a GraphQL query or, or mutation, um, are there any other parts of the stack that would be worth uh, investigating for security issues? Well, um, that's actually a very... Th a, a very interesting question because I've been working on that recently at Screen. Well, it's an onion thing and uh, or it's an Aussie uh, network level thing. So you've got network things where you need to protect your network. You need to prevent network attacks. Then you've got operating system attacks because your application is running on an operating system. So you need to protect that and you need firewalls and antiviruses and you need to make sure nobody tampers with that. Then you've got, and that's really true, the HTTP layer where you can have uh, attacks on the HTTP or the HTTPS layer uh, like slow or um, or even attacks uh, through the HTTP part of the URL that can be detected by security tools. And then you've got the layer of GraphQL. So yeah, because we are layering things, it pushes us to have a, a layered security in AppSec, which is something really new because AppSec is uh, probably something that existed for 20 years with the appearance of a WASP. And we were thinking HTTP. And now we've got those protocols over HTTP or over alternative to HTTP, such as uh, gRPC, which tells us, hey, you have to do HTTP, then the layer above. So yeah, actually it's a stack problem. Very cool. Um, that's all the time we have. Somebody was asking for some resources. So I would definitely say find, find you on either email or, or Twitter, and I'm sure you're happy to point them in the right direction. Thanks again for the talk. Always great having you and uh, see you around. My, my pleasure. Have a great day. Bye-bye, Jesse.